Greetings, First Congregational Church in Guilford. Welcome to our virtual service. As we are fond of saying in the UCC, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your faith or life journey, you are welcome and you are wanted here. This past week, we entered into Lent on Ash Wednesday, and Rachel and I had the opportunity to plan and lead that service as we have the opportunity to plan and lead this one. So today we will be taking up some of the themes that we invited folks to consider there, our stance of humility and awe at being small pieces in this large universe that God has created. And there we begin with reading Job 38, which is where God responds to Job speaking out of the whirlwind conveying from the biggest to the smallest pieces of the universe everything that God has created. So we began with the very first part of that passage Wednesday, and we were going to enter back into that scripture midway through to hear the rest of what God is speaking from the whirlwind. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? where I reserve for times of trouble? What is the place to where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? Does the rain have a father who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the surface of the deep is frozen? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who gives the pheasant wisdom or the rooster understanding? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch them, the doe bear her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time that they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young, their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. They leave and do not return. Who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it its wasteland home, the salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion of town, it does not hear the driver's shout. It ranges the hills for its pasture and searches for any green thing. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? May God grant us wisdom and understanding to this passage. Friends, as I described on Ash Wednesday, we entered the season of Lent with the invitation to see our smallness inside the largeness of God. Like today, we contemplated scripture from Job, the first part of God speaking out of the whirlwind, pelting Job with a dizzying array of all that God has set in motion until all we can do is throw up our hands surrendering and repenting of our arrogance that we ever thought we could understand everything. And in marking ourselves on Wednesday with ashes, we entered this landscape of Lent where memory always points us back to our source and sustenance, God. The creator of the cosmos and the caterpillar the divine who entered into the dust with us to share in the joy and terror, 
the dignity and the overwhelm of being matter that matters. Today, we return to Job and hear the rest of God's speech from the whirlwind. Here we are no longer asked if we were there to witness when the stars first sang together, or if, if we have the power to give shape to the ocean and set its boundaries. Line by line, we get closer and closer to what is right in front of us most of the time, should we but notice. The paths of thunderstorms and the morning dew, clouds and clods of earth, and then, toward the end of chapter 38 and the beginning of chapter 39, God asks some rather surprising, intimate questions, emphasizing a few particular creatures. God asks, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time that they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow strong in the wilds. Now, I don't know about you, but Job 39 may have been the first time I considered the labor pains and birth of mountain goats. That is, until I had the privilege of encountering them for the first time when I went on a backpacking trip in the Beartooth Wilderness in Southern Montana. My stepdad has been doing this trip for over 50 years, and the first time I went in my early 20s, I was warned that our first few campsites, which are at just under 11,000 feet, would potentially include some surprise encounters. Not with grizzly bears or deer, or moose are other more charismatic critters in our popular imagination, but with mountain goats. There was a practical reason for this warning from my stepdad. As it turns out, mountain goats are deprived and therefore attracted to salt. Salt in our sweat, our food, and even in our urine. Thus, my friends and I were warned that we should take our business as far away from camp as possible, lest we be overrun. Now, I must say, I did not totally believe my stepdad, who is not always the most reliable conveyor of information, shall we say. My disbelief was further confirmed when we arrived at the camp campsite and our freeze-dried dinners and huddled around waiting for sunset stories came and, and went without any sightings of our four-legged friends. But then my friend Noah and I, despite our best efforts and tired legs, could not manage to fall asleep. And so we decided to take our sleeping bags and go sit out by the lake as far away from the camp as possible so as not to disturb our fellow campers. Cold but content under the brilliance of that night sky, so far from light pollution that so often dims the stars. We sat with our backs leaning against one of the huge boulders scattered around the lake for what seemed like hours, lost, at times in our conversation and at others in silence, only punctuated by the trickle of the inlet flowing into the lake. Then out of that wonderfully disorienting dark, we heard footsteps, or hoof steps, rocks falling and moving behind us. Disoriented and more than a little frightened, we jumped up with our headlamps to look around. And there, only a few feet away, were half a dozen mountain goats staring right back at us. Almost as surprising as their presence was that they did not seem surprised by ours. Or maybe it was not so much that they were not surprised as it was that they were home and we were not. Here is where their young thrive and grow strong in the wild. Here among these glacially formed lakes and ancient Precambrian rocks, 
is the place where they know birth and death, need and hunger and joy, what it feels like to be a mountain goat held in the hands of the creator. We were visitors. Visitors glimpsing lives that went on before and would go on long after our presence. And perhaps this is why God pauses here, or part of it. Why God slows down not only to name for Job that he does not and cannot comprehend the lives of all God's creatures, but also to name that we humans are but one among many held in the hands of our creator. Not more important, not less important, just important. Matter that matters to God. And when it became clear to Noah and I that this was a standoff we would not win, we scurried back to our tent, caught in fits of giggles, surprised but also shaken. Shaken by our recognition that we were strangers here. We humans who have the power to craft our little kingdoms over which we think we have control are actually caught up in a story so much larger, stranger, and more mysterious. A story in which, if we are indeed at the center, then it is a center shared with mountain goats and moss, millipedes, and even mosquitoes. That next morning, the mountain goats had moved on, had not moved on. They ambled about just beyond our campsite, sometimes seeming interested in us and sometimes not. In the daylight, we could admire them more fully, their fluffy white tufts of hair caught in the wind, their strength and snorts, their ease in being themselves. And much to our delight, in the daylight, we saw that they had two mountain goat babies, or kids as they are known in the goat lexicon. They were probably born in late spring and only one or two months old by the time we saw them, spindly legged with that bold, quirky curiosity that takes such endearing and unique shape for all creatures first greeting this wild and wonderful world. Friends, at the beginning, of Lent, we are invited to contemplate and confront our mortality with recognizing our smallness inside the largeness of God. In that space, may the whirlwind of God speaking to us of and speaking to us from the places we can so easily forget help wake us up to the gravity of living in this wild and wonderful world. Help wake us up to the beauty and burdens of being this blessed dust. May it help prepare our hearts for the one who chose to share that beauty and burden alongside us in order that life forever be the final word. During my toddler and little kid days, my family frequented the Museum of Life and Science in my hometown of Durham, North Carolina. I loved two areas of the museum in particular, the Magic Wings Butterfly House and the Weather Exhibit. The Magic Wings Butterfly House is a glass conservatory that houses hundreds of butterflies in a tropical environment. I'd always go in with the desperate hope of making a winged friend. I'd sit crisscross applesauce and stick out my finger, praying that a butterfly might trust me against all the odds. I'd take a vow of gentleness and hope as hard as I could while still being as still as possible. And often a butterfly did land on my hand, even if just for a few moments fluttering to me and then stumbling around with the most delicate of legs. And then this tiny creature would fly off, usually onto a flower, I regret that I didn't savor those moments more. And then the weather exhibit. There was a delightful cloud bowl, a large wet stone bowl that could fit dozens of little kid hands. Vapor whirled around forming clouds. And if you cupped your hands just right, 
and look down at the perfect angle you were holding one. These fleeting formations from so high in the atmosphere were present to my fingertips. It was an exquisite experience, one that I now realize I took for granted. Perhaps what I love most about the butterfly house and the weather exhibit is the ability to hold in my hands what so often seems so far away. Butterflies and clouds normally grace the skies. Rarely in my day-to-day -day life do I find myself approaching them. And why don't I approach them more or even think more about these experiences? I've held a butterfly, I've held a cloud. What could possibly be more meaningful? What could approximate these experiences of holding elusive, fragile creatures and transient, ethereal mist? In the scripture, two of the questions we heard God ask Job were, do you know the laws of the heavens? And can you raise your voice to the clouds? And maybe the divine is asking those questions of all of us. Maybe we can muster up the courage to laugh and to smile and to remember, and then to tell her, I've known the laws of the heavens because I've held a butterfly. A little creature trusted me. It was nothing short of magical. I've raised my voice to the clouds. I've squealed while I held them in my hands. A dozen other little kids were there too. They saw and they remember. And I didn't thank the butterfly or the cloud. I took them for granted. But now I remember, I remember your deep, deep love for the dust and all the delight that that love brings. Each breath is borrowed air, not ours to keep and hold. And all our breaths as one declare Old wisdom long has known To live is to receive And answer back with praise To what our minds cannot conceive O souls of Yes. 
Jesus of God, our King.